Praise the Lord. <laughs> Can we just please for some seconds just stand up while we deliver the word? Thank you very much. Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 1 to verse 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Verse 4. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope when you were called. And the church say amen. amen. You can be seated. Father, thank you for your spirit that just lingers in the atmosphere of the house. God, thank you for those who are here today to hear the word. Lord, I'm asking for something that is humanly impossible. God, we are dreaming a dream that cannot be realized because of human strength or intellect. But we're asking, Father, that the body of Christ throughout the world, beginning here at Man of War, become one. Just as you have declared in your word that it is your will and your heart. In the name of Jesus. Would you say amen? amen. Uh, today is not the end. It's, in some way, it's the end of a part A of a series that's going to continue for several weeks called One. One. O-N-E. One. You hear in the passage in um, Ephesians how again and again the Apostle Paul, in writing to the Ephesians, continues to reiterate the necessity and the plan of God concerning unity, concerning one, oneness. He actually, if we'd gone on in verse five, he says, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. And so we see this overriding idea. Recently, I was in Orlando, Florida, and the general overseer of the churches of God preached a message called One. And I, I thought not being, I was moved by what he had to say, so there's no childish cleverness or no negativity in what I'm saying, but I thought, how ambitious an idea. And, and even I thought, as he preached more, he is dreaming. Because you know now there are 41,000 denominations around the world, Christian denominations. I tried to find the number of how many denominations there are in America, and actually no one knows. The numbers literally range from five to 70,000, 5,000 to 70,000 denominations, different churches, and we cannot get along. We divide because of the color of our skin. We divide because of our accent and the way that we speak. We divide because we are young and because we are old. We divide because we are rich and we are poor. We use any excuse that can be imagined to divide whenever it is the will of the Father and it is a holy dream that we ought to be one. Two weeks ago, I spoke specifically to the older saints and I challenged you to give up on the American idea of spending the last uh, 20% or 30% of your life in retirement playing shuffleboard, playing games while the world perishes. And I ask you to step into your assignment to get engaged. I challenged our young people to value our older saints and understand that when you have gray in the temple, you also have something of value to offer to the generation that follows. Last week, I talked specifically to the young people who are in a habit of saying, but I'm just a youth. Therefore, since I am just a child, I don't have to be responsible. I don't have to be mature. I don't have to imagine that I could do anything meaningful in my life or in the kingdom. I'll wait until I'm older. I've got my whole life before me. And Jeremiah, whenever the Lord called him, and he said, I am just a youth. I cannot speak for you. I'm just a youth. God said to him, do not say, I am but a youth. 
And so I'm, I've been asking us on both ends to cast aside our excuses and for the elderly to get engaged and for the, for the young people to get engaged and for those in the middle, those that have their feet, so to speak, in two boats at the same time in the 40s and the 50s, to, for us all to get engaged because after all, we are all called by one God and one Lord to one mission and to have one faith. And so day, today, I'm going to at least bring t- to a conclusion the first part of this series that's going to continue because next time I return to you, I'm going to actually preach out of this passage and not just use it as a backdrop. This passage that that Brother Gilbert shared with you, I'm going to use it not simply as a a background, but we're going to actually wade into it and ask ourselves, what does it actually mean uh, to be humble and to, and to, to strive and to fight for unity? What does that actually mean and how am I supposed to do that? But today, I really want to go in a specific direction. I want to talk about dreams. And I, I searched for and found this photograph of the Wright brothers uh, uh, that was taken on uh, December the 17th in 1903 in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, where these two brothers who since 1896 had been using material that had literally been around for centuries, no kidding, um, I thought about it and if I'd had time and my life was not so busy, I would have brought some things, the, the same kinds of things they used to make the first flying machine was the same kinds of things that, uh, that, that Rembrandt and Leonardo da Vinci used to paint on canvas and sticks just put together in a different way so that it would capture the magic of the wind and create the first flying machine. And, and, and I've wondered in the spirit of dreaming what it would have been like to have been there that morning uh, to stand there in the salty air and taste the salt on your lips and feel the 20 mile an hour wind in your face and be there just as dawn was beginning to break as those gentlemen had showed up on that day and rolled that thing out of a nearby barn and, and literally flew almost a thousand feet. And, and, and in some ways, the whole world flew that day. In, in some, for, for literally for thousands of years, we had all been bound to this earth. And, and anyone who talked about flying up where the birds would soar so effortlessly, they were mocked as mere dreamers. But that day, it literally ushered in a change. The whole world changed that day. And, and, but that's in a very temporal sense. There was something that happened uh, a, a few thousand years ago that bears discussion for us today because while we are dreaming this dream of unity here at Manowar Church where the older saints value the young people and young people value the old people and everyone locks arms and labors together for the mission, for the cause, for the purpose, that seems very dreamlike and it would not be possible, I think, in any way except of something remarkable that took place. After all, Adam sinned, and down through the ages, the lost condition of man seemed to be all that, the, that God was about, looking for a plan and a way to redeem a lost and, 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 a, and a dying people that, had, that were lost in their sin because Adam had failed. All of mankind was fallen, and the prophets uh, spoke their prophecies, and God showed up in many ways. But then, then one day, Jesus shows up as a babe and a man and walked among us and allowed himself to be nailed to an old rugged cross and rose from the dead on the third day and ascended into the heavens. But before he went away, he said that, that it would be essential that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, will not come. So we go forward now into the book of Acts, and in Acts chapter 2, it tells us there about the outpouring. And, and interestingly, we are let to know that they are there together in one place in one accord. It seems that whenever people get their minds set upon one thing, it's not just that like the Wright brothers, they're able to solve a problem that no one could solve for literally millennia. It's not just that, but it seems that whenever the people of God come together in unity, that God himself shows up in the midst of them. There's something, it's not, it's not just a clever idea. It's not a Johnny come lately idea. He said, if two or three are gathered in my name, he's not just talking about being in the same place. He's talking about a unity of purpose and a unity of thought and a unity of mind when we gather together in his name and really acknowledge that he is Lord and we are just servants of this great king, then we have set ourselves up for a, a time transition moment where the impossible becomes possible and the unreal 
becomes a reality. Listen to what is said in Acts chapter 2 and verse 17 because what happened is that the Holy Ghost fell. They were all filled. They stumbled out of the upper room speaking the, the magnificent glory of God in everybody's language and in everybody's dialect and everybody in the marketplace could understand as 120 people were fluently speaking languages that they had never learned and they are caught off guard and they are looking for an explanation. Are these people drunk? And Peter says, no, they are not drunk as you suppose. And he gave all of that argument. And then finally, when he comes down to the end, he says, really, what you are seeing is the fulfillment of a promise that was given to a prophet named Joel. You're actually seeing a promise taking place and I believe that you and I are living in the age of the realization of promises. Amen. We're living in the, in the, at the end of time, at the end of the age and God's got a lot of things yet to be done and I want you to know whenever he said to go into the world and preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations of men he was not trying to teach us a lesson in futility. He intended for it to be done and we're living at the end of the age and it must be done and we are the people who will do it amen give him praise so Peter said here's what you're seeing the prophet predicted it would happen in the last days God says I will pour out my spirit on all people your sons and your daughters will prophesy your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams hence this idea of dreaming together what is happening at Pentecost with the outpouring of this Holy Spirit is the opening of a new chapter in world history. I want to say that again. What happened that day, even though that the, the news reporters were not there and it happened among a relative handful, it was the beginning of a final chapter in the history of mankind. A chapter that is still continuing to this day. If you've ever read a book, you know that a book is divided into chapters and every chapter has a beginning, a middle and an ending. And the fact that that chapter may be long, the fact that it may be 2,000 years long does not mean that it was not a chapter in the history of mankind. And you and I are living in that chapter. But Vicki, we are in the last days, the last pages, the last sentence, the last few words of this. He said, in the last days, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit. And what began that day is a chapter that you and I are still living in. This chapter has at its heart this idea of dreaming together. I want you to get this. He, this is us. This is you and me. We live here in this place, in this chapter. This is us. I mean, we've got to see that this that is being written about. I told the young people last week that God knew you before you were even being knit together in your mother's womb. And the pages of your life were written in advance. So this book, this chapter, we're in it. And these promises that were being made that day, he went on to say, this is for you and for your children and to all those who are far off. That's us. The fact that it's taken a while to get here doesn't really matter. Young men will see visions. Old men, I, I, want, I want you to hear the unity. He's saying, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Young men get it. Old men get it, but it's not just a man thing. Sons and daughters and servants will prophesy. The Spirit, listen, listen. I could so easy head off in the wrong direction. In fact, it, uh, it, uh, this morning I was having a hard time sleeping in the morning hours and the Holy Spirit was dealing with me. And, 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 and I almost found myself resisting and saying, Lord, I, I don't really want to preach that. But I, I thought it, we could actually preach a sermon called Where Pentecostals Go Wrong. And we have turned the Holy Ghost into a, a lot of things. But I want you to hear me. Whenever the Holy Spirit comes, he brings a spirit of unity. If you're planning on planting a church that's just going to minister to black folk, I don't know what spirit is ministering to you, but it's not the Holy Spirit. If you're, if you're planning on planting a church that's just going to minister to rich white folks in the middle class, I don't know what spirit you're listening to, but it's not the Holy Spirit. L listen to me. If you're going to go across town and plan a hop up and down church for the young people because the old people don't, I don't know what spirit is ministering to you, but it is not the Holy Ghost. 
at his first appearance, he spoke to the old men, to the young men, to the sons, to the daughters, to the servants, to the rich, to the poor. Nobody was disenfranchised. He said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. <laughs> Hallelujah. May God genuinely open our eyes. I think how they're fighting in the streets of some of our cities in America and how we are divided and we have forgotten that the word of God says, but God has made of one blood all nations of men. Yes. Hallelujah. We have forgotten. May God open our eyes. Maybe we never knew. Maybe we've been so blinded by the God of this world. We don't know. But I just, I just, I, I, I thought how, we, we, we want the Holy Ghost and we want to use him for ourselves. We want, we want to be full of the Holy Ghost. So first of all, we can have a spiritual badge and look down our nose at our Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterian brothers like we got one notch up on everybody else. Ain't we cute? And, and, and then, and like that's not enough, we want the Holy Ghost. We want the Holy Ghost because after all, we have stepped out of the crowd and decided to follow Jesus in this radical way. So Trudy, we want the Holy Ghost to come and heal somebody so we can prove to all of our coworkers we got the real thing and they don't. We're trying to help God out and put God on the spot and say, God, show up, do a little song, do a little dance, give us some signs and wonders, and then everybody will know we're right, full of pride. My God, what a mess we're in, where Pentecostals go wrong. I want you to hear me. If you've got the Holy Ghost, you will love your brother and your sister. You will. And if you don't love your brother and your sister, whatever ghost you got, it ain't holy. So we're excited about the beneficial gifts, the gifts that will help us. The Holy Spirit came for purposes rarely discussed. And we're going to talk about that this morning in this idea of dreaming together. This passage begins with this phrase, in the last days it shall be, God declares. I want us to know that we are living in the last days. It might not seem like it to you and it might feel like it to you, but we are living in the last days. We're in the end of the chapter. That was the beginning of the chapter, Acts 2.17. Now we're at the end of the, I don't know if we're on the last page or on the last sentence or on the last word. I don't know. God could be just ready with that holy pen to put a period and all of a sudden Jesus comes from glory. Hallelujah. If we, knew, if we believe that, see that phrase is meant to communicate urgency. Urgency. It's time that the people of God stop playing church. It's time that the people of God got down to business if we believed for a moment that we were living in the last days that means that we would recognize that in these final hours we're approaching a time do you get this we are almost there where there be no more sermons no more preaching we're almost there no more altar calls none no more invitations Come to the altar if God's dealing with, no more. No more conversions. It's done. See, we're almost there to where that those who will be saved, he said, work while it is day for night comes. Yeah. See, it's almost night. It's almost over. Right. If we believe that, we wouldn't argue about how loud the PA system is or whether or not the building is too cool or whether or not somebody, we, we wouldn't even think about the things, the petty things that divide us. We think we've got forever to work this thing out, but it's the last days. Amen. I'm telling you, I'll tell you how close we are. Every time you step outside, you ought to look up toward the east. Keep your eyes toward the eastern sky. Lift up your head. Redemption draweth nigh. At any moment, at any moment, we don't talk about it. We don't think about it. We don't really believe it. I believe as sure as I'm speaking to you that the angel that cares for that white horse, the stable that keeps the horse that the Son of God, I, I believe that all the work is done and they just keep, they keep one eye toward the heavenly Father looking for a glance, a glimpse, a word that says, go get my people.
Hallelujah. Threw my glasses on the floor. If we believe that, we would be different. We would strive for unity. We would pay whatever price was necessary. We would do whatever was necessary. In the passage that my brother read, he said, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We would endeavor to make sure that unity was the prevailing order of the day. We would not allow ourselves to be engaged in anything that was divisive in any way. We would have a sense of urgency. So he said, not only are we living in the last days, he makes specific reference to a pouring out. He said, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. I, 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 we're not dreaming that in the few remaining hours that God could actually save everybody. We're not dreaming that. We're dreaming, I wish they would use me to sing a solo next Sunday. We're dreaming they should give me a class. I'm better than the people they've got teaching. We're dreaming, why don't the, why don't the state overseer give me a church? We're dreaming. We're just dreaming empty, but it's because we don't sense the urgency of the moment. We need to be dreaming. How is it possible for us to use the money that we've got and the technology that we've got and the time that we have to win the whole world? What, what could we do if we all put our minds to, if we all put our heads together, if we all, what, what kind of difference could we actually make if we actually pooled our resources and came together as one? I believe that it would be possible for us to soar in ways that we never imagined, like those guys did on that day. He said, I'll pour out of my spirit. I want you to hear me. We are not called by God to a frustrating, unfinishable, discouraging, gloomy task of reaching all flesh. He said, I will pour out of my spirit. He will pour out, according to Ephesians 3.19, the fullness of God. 5.18, the fullness of the spirit. Romans 5.29, the fullness of of Christ he would say such a thing because the Bible said of the 120 that were in the upper room in one place in one accord in one mind that they were all what filled <laughs> hallelujah we, we, we if we were dreaming our passion the thing that would be wake us up at night and say God am I full of you do I have all that you've got the fullness of God will be sufficient to reach all flesh when we're operating in the, uh, I, I, can I just be honest with you? I'll tell you what we're full of. We're full of ourselves. We're full of pride. We're full of self-interest. We're full of me, my, and mine. That's what we're full of. But he said, I want you to be full of the Spirit. He said, I will pour out. I, I don't want to dribble. I don't want to drop. I want an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Trudy, this morning, I mean, it's a, what an incredible prayer asking the Holy Spirit to break out of what? Out of the box that we've put him in. We, 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 what we want to do is we want to make sure that we keep the Holy Spirit manageable. Keep him in his corner. Keep him in his place and let him out when we want him. My God, I'm saying pour out upon us and have your divine way in whatever time that we've got left. Hallelujah. He said, and in the last days it shall be, God declares. I will pour out of my spirit on who? On all flesh. On all flesh. Man of war, I believe that you're getting this. So I'm not beating you up, but I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. It's one thing for us to want God to make us a true representative slice of this community so that people who are not like us, people that we don't get, people that we don't understand, people that we didn't grow up like we grow up, and people that don't have the same diet that we have. You know what I'm saying? People that, that their favorite meal is something you've never tasted. You know what I'm talking about? It's one thing to say, God, send us a slice so we can say, well, we got some Hispanics and we got some Russians and we got some Africans and we got, uh, aren't we special? No, he said, I'll pour out my spirit. We actually have to lift our head to the world beyond our walls and say, I'm dreaming for that. 
That's what, that's my dream. That's the dream that God has planted in my heart. Go ye therefore into the, all the world so that we are truly a church that is interested in whatever is taking place beyond our walls. And we are moved by compassion when we see what is broken and empty and hurting and destitute and, and addicted and bound out there. It ought to tear us till we want to be full enough to be a difference maker. I'm talking about dreaming together. When the prophet Joel and the apostle Peter say that young men will see visions and old men will see dreams, listen to me, they're in reference to nothing natural, nothing temporal, and nothing personal. I could have said selfish. But he wasn't talking about that. They're talking about dreaming together concerning kingdom activity. God did not give you the Holy Ghost so that you could dream a bigger home. You can pull that off without the Holy Ghost's help. Nothing wrong with big houses. I guess they got their place. I got one. I'd love it. If you want it, come see me. And if, and if you're not serious, don't make an offer. Can I, can I be honest with you? I've had that stuff. It does not satisfy. I spent my life pursuing my dreams. And tearing down my barns and build bigger barns in the name of Jesus. I did all that stuff. I've sold out. I don't want any of that stuff anymore. I don't know how to get rid of it. I'm trying to get rid of it. And I guess that's all right. But that is not why he sent his Holy Spirit to enable us to dream earthly, temporal dreams in this life alone. He's talking about kingdom activity, where they're actually saying, I'm wondering, Pastor, I was just thinking, do you think it would be possible? I mean, I got Sister Angela involved in this process of gathering clothes for, uh, for the children of Cameroon, and, and, and I, 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 don't, I can't imagine that she has bothered any of you, but if she gets under your skin, I hope she does go home, get some stuff. If you don't have any toys and clothes for kids, go buy some and bring it to her and get her off your back. I just love the fact that she's... She is burning with passion for people she has never met. I just love it. And she's dreaming. She's wondering how big of a container can we fill with stuff? What can we do? And she's looking for boxes. And I'm just simply saying, dream something for God. Dream something for somebody outside the walls of this church. And watch what God will do with your incredible, marvelous dream. Listen, I, this is not just Mitchell Tollisms. Listen, in Acts chapter 9, Ananias had a vision to go commission Paul for his great commission, for his great missionary work. The apostle Paul was outside the fold. The apostle Paul was busy putting Christians to death. The apostle Paul is not the kind of guy you want to go recruit to be your chief Christian, right? But Ananias heard the voice of the Lord, and in a vision, he went to where Paul was, and he anointed him for his missionary work. Who do you know? Who do you know? My friend Doug Small brought us together one time for a prayer meeting over at the campground. And he asked us to pray this way. He said, who do you know in your city? What name do you know in your nation that if God was to save them right now, that it would have a radical impact on this culture? At that time when he asked that uh, Oprah Winfrey had her show and was this the biggest thing in America. And somebody said, my God, what would it be like if Oprah Winfrey walked on her show and said that God just arrested her heart and she had fell at the cross and given her life and heart to Jesus Christ? I mean, who do you know? Who are you working with? Your boss, your neighbor across the street. Who is it where God has planted you and given you influence and you know their name and they are not saved today because you're not dreaming them saved? You're not taking any chance calling their name out before the throne of God. It's only been a few years ago that Lynn and I began calling out the names of people that we do in our family that were not saved. And I'll be honest with you, we're to the place now we're just about out of names. I'm serious. I'm serious. I got, I, I've, I've, got a, I've got a nephew that was, he was a, 
brilliant, brilliant kid. He was, a, he was a, an ace Bible quizzer, and, and MJ had him on the Bible quizzing team at Berea, and man, he was, he was dangerous. He was smart. He knew the Bible backwards and forward, and he was so smart. At some point, he kind of began to get cynical about God and the things of God, and, and we all reached out to him, and he had a tender heart, and he just kind of was judgmental about church and pastors and all the things that we do wrong. He noticed them all. He noticed them all. Just like a lot of the people you're trying to minister to. We didn't know how to reach him. So we just began to call out his name in prayer. Guess what? Him and his family are all saved and all in church. All of them. So Ananias had a vision about a a, a renegade, a Christian killer. And he got up from that vision and went and anointed him for his great missionary work. In Acts chapter 10, Peter has a vision to carry the gospel to the Gentiles at Cornelius' house. And he said, but God, they're unclean. He said, don't you call unclean what I have cleansed. All flesh, all flesh, the promise. In Acts 16, Paul has a vision of the Europeans where they are saying, come over to Macedonia and preach to us. And my God, all he could do was get up and go to Mass. I'm talking about that kind of vision where God begins to wake you, young person, in the middle of the night and say, what can I do? What could you do? God will drop something into your spirit where in your corner of the world you become a light to a dark and a perishing generation. And get, listen to me. You look at me and look at us rightfully so and say, Pastor, Papa, you mean well. But you don't know how to even talk to us. You can't even speak our language. You're trying to reach us, but you don't know how to reach us. So may the, may the vision that burns in me become a dream in you. And you start dreaming ways that you can reach your own generation. Because you can do what we cannot do. But it'll be all of us dreaming together for our own part of the harvest field. And as we dream together, the Holy Spirit will then fill us with all of the necessary fullness so that nothing will be withheld. When the Spirit comes in His fullness, we will come together, we will dream together, and we will ultimately finish together. I'm just going to quit. I'm going to read a quote from Andy Stanley, one of my favorite Preachers, he's a mentor to me, though we have never met. This is what he said. We do not have the right to take our talents that God gave you, abilities that God gave you, experiences, opportunities, and education, and run off in any direction we please. We lost that right at Calvary. At the same time, we have no right to live visionless lives either. If God had a vision for what you are to do with your allotment of years, with your talents, abilities, experiences, and education, you better get with it. I'm still quoting. You better get on it, he said. Missing out on God's plan for our lives must be the greatest tragedy this side of eternity. So God is calling us. I don't know what he's doing at the church down the street. I have to believe it's something similar. The Holy Spirit is not divided. So I I cannot imagine that any church in this city, any church in this nation, any church in the world that's preaching the Bible is not hearing a similar word. What are you going to do with what I've given you in the time that remains? Are you going to sense the urgency? Are you going to use the gifts to get something done? When you stand before him, what will he say? Well, you did the best you could, I guess. I want us to be able to, with Apostle Paul, to stand and say, I've run the race. Kept the fight. Chris, finished. I finished. I finished the course. I finished. I didn't run until I retired and sat down and played shuffleboard. 
I didn't wait to start running when I was older. But when I heard the gun sound and the race began, I started and I ran. When, when, when we do that, he will speak to us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in. Do you know what it's like to disappoint someone? You ever done that? I have. If you've never disappointed anyone, you're way better than me. They had expectations and and I had every ability to do it. But between, somewhere between the beginning and the ending, I wandered off. I lost interest. I, I drifted. I, you can call it a lot of things, but in the end, I failed. I failed. The Apostle Paul said of himself, I didn't do that. You know, I, I've got to quit because I'm so aware of time, but, I, so, but l- let me say this. You, you know what amazes me? I, I, I get how you get where you are, because so many pastors are just playing. I mean, really, just playing. Uh, I talked to the overseer a few days ago, and you don't know what I'm talking about, and you don't need to know. But I said something, and he said, you know, do you know what my problem is? I've got a lot of pastors who are just hobbyists. Preaching is something they do in their spare time. Pastoring is something they do when they have nothing else to do. I'll be honest, that troubled me so bad. I took that to my prayer closet. And I asked God, is that me? Is that what I have become? How are you going to save the world through us? I know you're a big God. But you have chosen to do your will in the earth through men like me. And like you, your ministers, every one of you are ministers. No license, no position, no salary, but you're all called to ministry. All of us. So as we walk forward from today, I'm asking you to Get a vision for an infilling, a personal infilling. I'm not going to try to do this on my own, God. I can't. So you poured out your spirit on them. So pour it out on me. Fill me up. I I want you to get a vision. I want you to dream that. I want you to dream. I know some of you saints will know. I want you to dream waking up, waking yourself up, speaking in tongues. Dream that. So full of the Holy Ghost that when you're asleep, He's still dancing in your mind. Making intercession on your behalf while you're too tired to make it. And you just wake yourself up speaking in tongues. I want you to dream a dream of unity where you're so connected. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what every pastor needs I need people that I can push do you know what I'm saying people don't have to apologize I hate to bother you I I don't want to seem pushy but I got 400,000 people in my county going to hell And it seems like we could be the only help they got. And I was just wondering, could you spare a couple of minutes to pray and to do something in the kingdom? I need some people that would say, I'm here. I met with the elders the other day and I said, I'll tell you what I want. I want some people that will say, I am with you. Look, I'm not with you, pastor, because you're perfect. We already got that part figured out. 
I'm just here till he comes. I sense him in this house so real. You have heard my voice. You are my child. You know my voice. I have called you. The call has been specific and clear. Uncomfortable, unsettling, but clear. You know it. Do not say I am but a youth. Or that I am too old. For I have called you for my own divine purposes. I have called you my eye is upon you my hand is upon you and my anointing is available to you I will fill you if you will step out in faith and obey my voice says the Lord who is calling labors into the harvest hallelujah would you give him praise stand up on your feet stand up on your feet